This is episode number six of DTY Talks. And today we're talking to philanthropic fitness coach Jeff Myers about some of his favorite low-cost workouts and how we can get started on our fitness journeys at any age. This is Jeff. I thought I was punctual. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) How are you? I am doing well. How about yourself? I can't complain. Just well, just to let you know, I know we discussed it through email, but this is DTY Talks, which is Doctors to You Talks, and what we do is promote your business, your whatever it is you're offering, whether it's a service or whether it's a product, and we talk to you about it, and you tell us everything you want to know about what it is you're doing and what it is you're offering, who you are. Uh, so, as I mentioned before, I don't know a whole lot. Uh, I was just told that you have done some things in fitness and you have integrated that with some charitable work. So let's just jump right into that. Tell us about your role of fitness and what led you to merging fitness with charity. Okay, so I actually started training in 2012. I was actually doing a bunch of neighborhood work, actually. just uh, I actually was into boxing. So for me to be in boxing and realizing the benefits that I was receiving in boxing, I decided that, you know, individuals in my community also can receive these benefits as well. And, of course, this will actually promote a better community. At least that was coming from my eyes at that point in time. So that being said, I started training a couple of people in the community, and then individuals told me I should become certified. I should get certified, and that's what I did. I actually got certified um, through WITS, World Instructor Training School, and actually then I started working for a conventional gym. As I began to work for a conventional gym, I realized more and more that it was more on the realm of individuals that have access and the ability to um, afford membership mm-hmm. and afford that kind of training. So it was taking me a little bit out of that spot when it came down to where my energy was built off of, more in the underprivileged or the areas that don't have as much resources and accessibility to things. That's actually the group of or the individuals that I wanted to target more so. So that being said, I started doing races. I started running for different health-related reasons, ran for Parkinson, epilepsy, leukemia, lupus, different races, basically, so I could bring some more um, information out for the community so they can become more knowledgeable and also so they can become active as well. So I did that for a couple of different programs, and I also started, I'm actually in Arlington, Virginia now, and I'm working with a, a nonprofit called Arlington Thrive. And they actually have a running club for the George Washington Parkway Classics, in which this was my third year actually working with that group. And basically, we just train individuals that wanted to be a part of the running club and train them and get them prepared for the race. And basically, that's what I've been doing. I started my own business in um, Arlington, Virginia, working out of a studio. I have about 23 clients. That's my primary source and what I do basically for 28 hours throughout the week. And outside of that, that's when I do the races and the charitable things and try to get to those uh, communities that doesn't have as much accessibility resources or access to the, you know, things that other individuals does have in order which making them very healthy. Health. So how do you how do you choose uh, who you're going to work with when you on the charitable side? So on the charitable side, normally when I'm looking at a community, I try to look at the underprivileged area. Though I look at an income bracket, I can actually check Mm -hmm. it out that way as well. When I look at the income bracket, I'll see what's the average income in that area. And when I see what's the average income, then I'll try to find the lowest or the individuals where people will look at and say they are not as fortunate. And once I realize that, I look at the institutions, organizations, even sometimes when it comes down to like churches and things like that, that may be in that area, any way I can get access to that community. And once I find out what churches or institutions or what's, you know, promoting any kind of um, health-oriented things, I'll actually present to them any kind of ideas as far as me doing boot camps there or me doing a race or things to that extent. And, of course, they would jump on with no problem at all. Let's talk about uh, women and the misconception because, um, you know, with different forms of fitness now, we just did an article a couple of weeks ago on CrossFit and, you know, some of the more, uh, pop, you know, things that are becoming more popular nowadays. Cycling is another one that's, that's becoming, uh, with soul cycling, it's becoming really, really popular. And women have always been, had a, a segment of the population that came to how fitness was marketed. But 
how how would you say or is there a difference? And I usually like to ask this to my people who are who I'm interviewing or talking to who are into fitness because the way it's marketed, it's like women should do this, men should do this. And yeah. and some people, most of the fitness people are like, that's not necessarily true. <laughs> right. So let's talk about those misconceptions um, that women seem to have about fitness, especially when it comes to, like, weight training and resistance training. And um, what's your opinion about that and how should they approach it? So if you go into any conventional gym, the women are all doing cardio. They're all on the cardio side, and the men is all in the resistance <laughs> training side. The men are mm-hmm. afraid to go in the cardio realm, and the women are afraid to go into the resistance <laughs> training realm. But I, I will mm-hmm. say, at least the women are taking a more intelligent approach because they say that they don't want to go in the weight training realm because they're afraid to hurt themselves. So that's mm-hmm. understandable. And actually, that's why it's important to get some kind of coach or some kind of trainer that can assist you and teach you how to, you know, use the equipment correctly. And that makes sense also because the woman has less testosterone levels so, and that being said, they cannot get bulky. That's a misconception. Exactly, as far as yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's impossible, actually. Only reason why they have that conception or perception that that's possible is because of TV. A uh, TV, mm-hmm. these women mm-hmm. may be using supplements. They may be using different kind of substances and or Photoshop or things to that extent. But naturally, that cannot happen. It just it just won't happen. Um, tone, right. yes, you can get really toned and defined, but... Big and bulky, no, not likely unless you have some kind of genetics that we are not too familiar with. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that would be the only case. And, yeah, that would be the biggest misconception, actually, that I believe that women have. But other than that, when it comes down to men and women, I think functional training in general we all should, you know, try to pursue. Because that's going to mm-hmm. work for the long run as far as promoting that longevity, the functional training mm-hmm. as far as what you're doing in your everyday lifestyles, rather you may be lifting whatever your job making for stuff, or rather you, you know, running with kids, if you're doing a lot of walking upstairs or anything to that extent, you want to try to do training that will support that. Um, so just creating simulations that's going to help benefit those different muscles, those different ligaments. If you need the cardiovascular or respiratory system, it will support that as well. And that's what you should train towards, not necessarily, you know, it's just this regimen to get you here. This re- No, we're trying to live long and live healthy. That's the idea mm-hmm. behind it. And when you say functional, um, just to be clear with some people who may not uh, be familiar with the term, you mean the way our body naturally moves, correct? Yes. Complete exactly, exactly. Yeah, because natural. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I was just going to say yeah because sometimes we can get into the gym and some of these machines are not necessarily how we naturally move. Right. And yeah. <laughs> right. Just to be clear with that because yeah some of some of the machines we do have to be careful. Personally, I was I had a little injury on the treadmill, which the treadmill is how we actually move, but <laughs> kind of had a little meniscus thing from running on the treadmill uh-huh. and hyperextended my knee right. My leg, it, you know, it's kind of bent funny. But um, but that's, that's great advice is focusing on functional movements. And, again, that is, that's something that we do try to, um, try to promote in some of the, like, articles and some of the content that we put out um, just here with Dr. C.U. is, you know, even if you can't afford, like you said, the, the expensive gyms or the, even with CrossFit, I was a little leery about writing about it because it is one of those things that's kind of, you know, elitist in some ways. Yeah. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, but I did want to, you know, again, focusing on the word that you used, the, that CrossFit is, is one of those ones that does focus on the functional movements. It's really big. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, and and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. Oh, and, you know, the challenge also with individuals when it comes down to CrossFit, not saying that there's anything with, wrong with CrossFit or those high-intensity mm-hmm. training because it's very beneficial, but it goes beyond the functional movement. It's very complex movements that you're actually utilizing, different weights and kettlebells and, and, you know, heavy equipment, and it's very complex movements that our body is not used to doing every day. And even if you know, you're just now getting into the gym. You got to think about what you have done since middle school going up with sports mm-hmm. you got involved in. And if you really can calculate those things as far as how active you were and what kind of movements you were doing, you can actually prevent injuries and you can actually train and actually find the perfect routine in order to operate under. 
Hmm. That's perfect advice. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. And then that leads me into what are some of your favorite styles or approaches to fitness and why? And how do you um, – how they help you find balance. So some of the the, the uh, styles of exercise, I guess, uh, is what we want to know about that you prefer. Okay, well, um, I'm big on calisthenics, and that's just body weight. I'm not hmm. big on being in the gym, lifting a bunch of heavy weights that's two times your size. That's actually going to lead to injury, and that's actually going to lead to other impediments. So my biggest thing is constantly, if you can lift your body weight, if you can do push-ups or if you can do, you know, sit-ups, just a bunch of functional things that can support your body weight, you will be living the optimal, healthy, physically life. It will be very healthy to the extent where you don't have to worry about weight bearing on your joints. You don't have to worry about any kind of torn ligaments or anything to that extent um, due to too much weight bearing. You won't have to worry about any kind of accidents because of bad posture form or anything to that extent. Um, so basically I promote calisthenics and take a very holistic approach as well, and that's basically just being all natural. Like all natural is what I actually strive for when it comes down to my clients and my approach that I take. That also, um, when you mentioned natural and, and, and all of that, it, it leads me to ask about your approach to um, discussing uh, nutrition and how that fits in with fitness as well. So what are your your opinions or your outlook on that, especially when you're talking to your new clients or beginners? So very, very important, actually. Um, that's the fuel. That's actually what you consist of is everything that you're consuming. So basically if it's an individual that's very fragile that breaks apart very easily, it's because they're consuming a bunch of food that may be processed that breaks apart really easy that's not supporting them with the proper enzymes, you know, vitamins and minerals and things to that extent mm -hmm. to help build good cellular structure. So that being said, when it comes down to individuals and in nutrition, I'm big on bioindividuality. I don't believe that there's one diet that fits all. I don't but to a certain extent, I don't even believe in diet. I more so believe mm -hmm. in you figuring out what you want to do as far as the, whatever you're competing for or what you're preparing for, if it's just, you know, some functional things in order to get through the day and then fuel yourself to support that. So if you're going to be doing a bunch of running, then, yes, that's when you want to take in a bunch of carbohydrates or have that mm -hmm. to be the biggest portion of your dish. Or if you want to do a bunch of lifting, then you're going to take in more protein. So you're going to have more protein on your dish or you'll be consuming more protein throughout the week. And, you know, and it'll vary depending on whatever you can, you're doing. And everyone is different. No one lives the same lifestyle to the extent where they're doing the same thing every day in which they need to consume the same diet or the same foods, food consumption as uh, someone else. It, it doesn't work that way. So it can be a, a big lead off or a, a misdirection if you believe that this one diet can support you. And also, you got to keep in mind the aspects of your age. You got to keep in mind as far as gender, your sex, um, even environment. You got to look at your environment. So if you know you're in an area where the water may not be good or the crops may not be good or a bunch of pesticides or even if it comes down to a bunch of allergies, you want to consider, okay, if I should be eating these local foods or if I should be drinking this tap water or if I – you really have to just be very vigilant and aware of a bunch of different factors that's surrounding you to determine what your diet should consist of. And and that's how you uh, talk to your like your beginners. That's how you you lay it out for them. Or do you have like a specific, um, I guess like a checklist or a, a questionnaire that you okay. use to yeah. That's that's a great question because that would be very intimidating for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I do agree. Um, so when it comes to my beginners, my biggest thing for my beginners is whatever you're eating now. I, I don't – is no drastic changes are needed because that's what's going to cause problems. You don't want to tell mm -hmm. anyone to cut this out and don't eat that no more because this is hurting. This is – no, you, you can't take that route because all it's going to do is make you have binge on something else. So you got to weed yourself off of it, whatever makes this stuff, and naturally you can just exercise. What are your bad habits? What do you consume a lot of? 
when you're feeling a certain emotion. And once they can tell you, they should be able to tell you that maybe, oh, I eat a lot of chocolate or I eat a lot of cheese or I eat a lot of, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then you would tell them, okay, let's cut that down. Let's cut the portion size down first. You cut the portion size down, that's not working. Okay, let me give you another alternative that still may have some sugar in it and because that's what you're seeking. You're looking, some individuals may um, want a bunch of, something with a bunch of sugar in it, but what it really is, they just need vitamin B. They just need energy. So they lack an energy. So if you can give them alternatives to help supplement what they may be consuming now that may not have enough nutrients in it, it can actually help them start transitioning their diet. And you got to also consider, you know, what the grocery stores consist of, what grocery stores may be around you, because you can't mm-hmm. give an uh, individual an uh, unrealistic diet goal or unrealistic plan, and they can't even get the ingredients or, or get what you may ask them to obtain. And what it's going right. to do is just going to throw them on a, a spin of, of, you know, having low self-esteem, losing motivation, and then they're going to just stop binging on something else. So you have to just be very um, – uh, what's the best term I would like to use – just moderate. Just I take a very low, moderate approach when it comes down to changing someone's diet, especially as a beginner. Beginner. So when it comes to your more advanced, or I, mean, I don't even know how advanced your clients are, or do you? Because it sounds like with the with the charitable work, you kind of move around, so you're probably working with a lot of beginners. But mm-hmm. um, let's just say maybe if you do have clients that maybe not necessarily beginners, maybe intermediate to advanced. Do you start to tinker with things like carb cycling, um, you know, where you're fluctuating your carbs just to kind of reach certain goals with the clients or just or, – or some people have calorie cycling where one day they may have more calories, the next day they may have less? Yeah. Uh, do you ever fool with that a little bit? <laughs> I mean – to a certain extent, if it's an individual that's prepping for maybe a triathlon or something to that mm-hmm. extent, they know more. They have a lot of knowledge already as far right. as what they're consuming. So as you mentioned, now at that point in time, you're just trying to figure out what time you're consuming things, the time frame of consuming it before the physical activity so you can know when that will reach your blood cells and basically oxygenate you to whatever extent. So it get real. Te- it can get real technical, um, mm-hmm. depending on the individuals and the understanding that they may have. Unfortunately, majority, I would say, maybe eighty-five to ninety percent have have no idea what they're consuming and how it's fueled within their body. And you, know, all our moods, when it comes down to moods, emotion, and things to that extent, a lot has to do with what we're consuming, and that's just swaying us in so many different directions. It's, it's like a, a if you want to use. Con- Compared to a car, it's just like a, a car with a bunch of different oils. You changing, you putting in different oils every month. That's going to throw the car off. The car eventually is going to break down. It's going to have, it's going to need repairs. It's going to, it's going to have problems because it doesn't know how to work efficiently, what will allow it to work efficiently, and to stay consistent, the timing, and you know everything to that extent. So it can get that extreme with more with individuals that's more aware of what they're they're consuming, for sure. And um, working with beginners, do you um, do you ever recommend supplements? Um, and it doesn't have to be anything drastic, but some like for I'll just say for me, I um, I, I I've tried doing vegan for about a year because I had mm-hmm. some health problems where I, my doctor took me off a lot of stuff, like like gluten was one of the main ones. She did the blood test. I was pretty much, you know, uh, couldn't hold things down. This was a couple of years ago. We just had a lot of digestion uh, issues, and she did a blood test, and we worked together, and she was like, you know, you need to cut out the gluten, cut out the soy, cut out the dairy, which I had already cut out dairy anyway, so that was easy. But it was, you know, when you start cutting out gluten, you're thinking about all the things. It's not just bread, the easy thing. Sometimes gluten is in things you don't have a clue that it's in, like the seasoning on chicken or something like that. So um, most of 2016 I did, uh, I was vegan until I probably about October started to feel like my hair was thinning. And I have really, really thick curly hair So mm-hmm. all my life. So then to start to feel like it's thinning, it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> got to be dietary. So right. anyway, with that being said, I, I started to reintroduce some, uh, I did eggs and fish. So now I do get the eggs and fish, you know, the B vitamins and the, obviously the protein. But... Um, protein-wise, 
I'm big on vegan protein, specifically like hemp, something that's a little cleaner, in my mm-hmm. opinion, just in my research, something a little bit on the cleaner side, not necessarily like rice protein, which can be a little scary. With You know, you consider the arsenic and things like that in rice. But I'm right. saying all that to say that sometimes supplements are not, you know, uh, energy boosters or something crazy where you don't know where it is. Sometimes it, sometimes it can be because of your diet you're not getting enough protein or you're not right. getting enough, um, you know, of something, iron, or something like even something like that, which is a vitamin. Do you ever recommend supplements that are like a hemp protein or something like that to beginners? And if so, what are they? <laughs> So when it comes down to beginners, the only thing that I will recommend, honestly, is multivitamins, Um, basically Mm -hmm. because it can try to hit all of those different things, those essential vitamins and minerals that we lack, and actually our food doesn't supply, and no matter how much you consume of it in a day, you still won't get the essential vitamins and minerals that we should consume within a day. So I will recommend the um, multivitamins, if anything, and then if you still feel that you may be deficient of anything, and, you know, as you mentioned, go to the doctors, get a blood test, figure out your deficiencies, and then you can start incorporating those different things um, and as far as getting the different vitamins for those different things, and more so all natural, um, no generic, try to stay away from generic stuff, um, but more so on the all natural and holistic end for sure. Um yeah, and that's what I would recommend for those beginners is just the multivitamins, if anything. And then on the food side, what are some of the foods that you are just <clears throat> you just kind of jump behind? I know some trainers, they say, you know, you, you definitely want to get in, you know, uh, the obvious ones are like the green leafies, and if you are a meat eater, try to get in some lean protein. But are there some ones that we may not expect that you're just like, you know what, this packs a punch? If people wouldn't know it, they probably don't need a lot of it, but this is something that is great for your diet just to incorporate if you can afford it. Specifically, if you can afford it, um, try to get it. Is you have one, some of those? Um, so I will say that um, I'm in school right now to be health coach um, in the, the School of Integrative Nutrition, and mm-hmm. what I'm learning more about is the gut bacteria. It's so unbelievable that we have more bacteria in our gut than bacteria in any other place in our body, about 70% Mm. of our bacteria is in the gut. So the thing is, we've been taking antibiotics for all our lives as children, anything happened, antibiotics, antibiotics. This is destroying that bacteria, the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm getting big on probiotics now and, you know, making sure you have that bacteria, that good bacteria within your gut because that's what's going to help break down enzymes, help the digestive system and things to that extent. I'm actually a pescatarian. Um, I've been Mm -hmm. about about 15 months, a little bit over a year. And for the first time, I tried some uh, pasta the other day after maybe two years of not eating beef, and there was actually beef in it. And it literally, it literally shut down my my whole left side. I woke up the next morning, and my whole left side was completely stiff. It was completely stiff, and I understood that this was my digestive system that actually kicked that in as far as my body. My body went into shock almost because it did not know how to digest this meat anymore. And not Mm -hmm. only... Not only did it not know how to uh, digest the meat, because I, for me not to eat it for so long, I don't have certain bacteria that can help it break down as well. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really big for individuals to know what they, they're consuming, what their body consists of, and also when it comes down to promoting any kind of substance or any kind of food, as you mentioned, I would definitely promote probiotics, if anything. Yeah, and that's that's cool because we we um, did a Tuesday talk. That's one of our other uh, content pieces is, uh, is uh, primarily on YouTube and Facebook. It's video based, where we talked about kombucha and mm-hmm. um, some of the other ones. Um, just throwing this out to folks if they're like you know probiotic. That's a pill. You, I mean, you know, you you don't have to take it in pill forms. Obviously, you know, in Greek right. yogurt, in yogurt. Mm-hmm. Um, you get good food. bacteria. Yeah, fermented, great. Fermented foods, you know, your sauerkraut, your kimchi. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, the kombucha is a fermented tea. Someone asked me, mm-hmm. what is kombucha? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a fermented tea. So, yeah, so that's that's actually really, really a great um, suggestion is to focus on the digestive health because a lot of our sickness, you know, when we get those colds easily, 
um, you know, those that inflammation and all of that sometimes could be led back to your digestive health. Ironically, it's like, you know, <laughs> where where is this coming from, you know, with the <laughs> inflammation and things like that? But some a lot of that stuff just starts in the gut. And keeping out yeah. keeping a clean gut can kinda of help us out a lot. So that's that's a really perfect suggestion um for that. When it comes to young people, we we want to start people young because I'm assuming uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot of the people that you train uh, on the charity side or charitable side are probably adults by this point. Um, yeah. Well, let me say, let me put it this way. When you train people who are adults by this point, they could have possibly have made some changes earlier on. Like they're at a point now where they're kind of stuck in their ways. Maybe they do want to make a change, but it's, a, it's, it's hard, especially when you don't yeah. have the resources. So, when you let's go, you know, rewind it back a little bit and talk about parents of young people. Um, mm-hmm. What do you suggest parents of young people add or try to eliminate or never even introduce <laughs> to their diets or routines early to better aid to when they're twenty five, thirty? You're not trying, you know, to push a boulder up a up a steep ninety degree hill with with trying to get them to change those dietary habits. So it's it's a very – that's actually a very challenging um, situation only because mm-hmm. as a young individual or a child, children in general, the parents are so much on the move and working that the children are consuming a lot of processed stuff. And, like, you know, you will give them the snacks and it's not as many home-cooked meals and everything is on the move and everything is on the go. So for the kids to be consuming, they, they're getting used to this high amount of sugar, the high amount of salt, and basically processed food in general. And they start adapting to it to the extent where if you present to them anything that's like a whole food or natural or vegetables or, you know, anything to that extent or natural sugar when it comes down to whole fruits, they're – they don't understand it. <laughs> they, they're they confused. They're like, you know, this doesn't taste right. This doesn't have that same flavor or that, that same feeling that I received when I was consuming the chips and the, the things to that extent. The problem is when it comes down to those chips and the big snack cabinet stuff that we all had in our pantry, with that it's market, it's money pushed behind that when it comes down to the marketing. So that's all we see on the television. That's all we see on the screen as far as advertisements. So they're getting the spotlight when it comes down to what the purpose for not only children, for adults, young adults, basically the whole spectrum of, of ages. And we are challenged by that because now we have to find an alternative source to get information to things that may be healthier, things that we can give to our kids that can help them on the long run when it comes down to them getting older. So, yes, it is very challenging only because of the lifestyle of the parents being so fast on pace and got to be to work and got to be there and got to be, you know, at this location. So they only can give those kids or the children snacks and things to that extent. But if it came down to me recommending anything, I will promote the parents to try to do as many home-cooked meals as they possibly can and trying to get the kids accustomed to that because growing up, and I'm only um, 28 years old, I was born in 89, so I don't have too much Mm -hmm. to talk about. But when it it came down to me growing up, I do remember the times where we used to sit down for dinner, me and all my sisters and my grandmother and mom, and, you know, we used to eat home-cooked meals every night. It, it, it changed completely. <laughs> we don't all mm-hmm. come to the same table, you know, and eat every evening because someone's doing this, someone's doing that, and everyone's on the move. So it's that fast-paced lifestyle that took over, and actually that, that's affecting our health big time. So, yeah, tell us about your business. Uh, is, is, it's called DMV's Finest. Correct. And um, what motivated you to get into fitness as a business? It's one thing, you know, you mentioned the the, uh, the charitable side of it, but you do have a business. So yeah. <laughs> what is your yeah. vision? What does your vision entail? And um, and specifically how, how you plan to continue to grow as a as a as a small business? Definitely. Um, so I would definitely say that most individuals, including myself, try to seek solutions to problems that goes on in the world and problems that goes on in the community, society, and just everything that's around us, our environment around us. So as I was growing and, and trying to find those solutions to those problems, it all came stemmed. The source was health, like the source of it 
always came back to health. It always came rooted back to health. When it came down to violence and mental health and all these different things, poverty, everything came back to health. So that's actually what promoted me into actually creating a business and working to help people and better themselves, help people learn about themselves, and help people, you know, be more aware of the things that they may be consuming that affects everything that's around them, affects even how they can perceive everything around them, which is actually going to affect how we react and communicate with each other. So with that being said, I wanted to just try to promote a healthier way of of perceiving, <laughs> you can put it that way, mm-hmm. a healthy, mm-hmm. healthier way of perceiving not only yourself but life and everything that's around you. And by doing so, I feel that I need to reach out to all the communities that I possibly can. And that being said, the communities that are more way better off, they have more resources and tools to apply in order to perceiving healthier. So the individuals in the underprivileged communities are the individuals that I want to show them that there's multiple alternatives. You're just looking at it from a certain lens that may not, you know, it may not be able to support your current situation. So I will give you alternatives from the knowledge that I received from going to school, the knowledge that I received from working with clients and working in different areas and learning different alternatives because Everyone's different, as I mentioned, about the bio-individuality thing. So when it comes down to my business, since I'm at health school, I'm becoming a health coach now, I'm actually going towards the nutritional aspect as well, starting to incorporate the nutritional aspect. And I'm actually planning on getting a couple of health coaches from underneath my business, and we're actually going to start going to different communities. I'm actually in Virginia. We're starting in Virginia, actually Arlington, Virginia. We're going to go into the different communities. We're going to offer our services for free, um, and we'll basically start coaching a couple of people within certain communities and giving them the chance to see how health coaching works, see how we can help them better their lives, and if they want to continue and work with us and work with the organization, they can. But that's actually the approach and the direction that I'm going as a business, and I will grow from that point. Oh, awesome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, we talked all about health and business and fitness and all that good stuff and young people and and how people can turn their lives around through health. Um, But I want to know a little bit more about you as a person, where you're from, where we mentioned now that you're in Virginia, northern Virginia, right outside of D.C. here. And um, where are you going? I mean, well, we we actually did discuss that a little bit as far as where you're going to go with your business. But let's just talk a little bit more candidly about who you are as a person. So I was born and ra- I was actually born in D.C., Washington, D.C., and I was raised in Capitol Heights, Maryland, um, and this is in Prince George's County. So I actually came from one of those areas where it, you know, it was underprivileged. It, we didn't have as many resources. We didn't we didn't have as much tools and and different grocery stores and and you know those resources that are very essential to having good health. And it actually creates a certain perspective. So being in that box in which I grew up in, I finally made it outside of that box and I can see from the outside in what was going on. And for me to see what was going on, that's when I started going to different communities to obtain more information and obtain more knowledge and alternatives in order to help change that perspective and the narrative, period. Um, so I've been doing that for since basically out of high school, actually, actually out of high school, I went to school for computer networking systems with ICG Tech, and I realized that I didn't have joy in being behind the computer and just, you know, mm-hmm. typing my life away. So I just felt like I had to do something where I can connect with people because I'm more of a, a people's person and I need that connection. I believe that's life. That's what gives me life. So that's where I turned my direction as far as when it came down to my profession and what I wanted to do in the future. So outside of that, now I'm in Crystal City. I actually just moved out here uh, two weeks ago, two weeks. Um, And, you know, I'm laying my ground down here. And actually I've been working out here. I work for Sport and Health Club. I worked for Sport and Health Club for two years, and I worked with them in Boston, in Arlington, Virginia, and I worked with them in Virginia Square in Arlington, Virginia. And I just finally got out of the conventional gym um, aspect and started doing my own thing in 2014. So actually, it's been a, a couple of years now. So where can we learn more? I know you mentioned that you are more. You, you've been doing the word of mouth thing, but it sounds like you're growing, even though you're still in school. Still sounds like you're growing <laughs> a lot yeah. with this. So um, if someone like a church or someone like that wanted to get in touch with you, how would they get in touch with you? 
So if they – oh, actually, they can go to the DMV's finest on Facebook. My contact information is on there. They can also go to the website. I have a, another website when it comes down to the health coaching that they can reach out to, and it has my contact information. I don't know. Let's see. You yeah, can send that it website. to me, and I can link it. So, yeah, That's so awesome. it was a pleasure talking to you, a pleasure meeting you. Likewise. Yes. Likewise. And, um, and Jeff Myers, Doctors to You Talks, and we will catch you next time. All right, thanks, Thank Jeff. you, guys.